I just really want to read a couple of verses and continue from where I was last time. Listen to Isaiah 11. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. Jesse. Yes, sir. <laughs> Jesse. Now, this was written before David was even born, but Jesse is the father of David. Amen. Well, another verse that I want to read, and this is powerful. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom, the Spirit of understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might the spirit of knowledge yes, and the spirit of the fear of the Lord. Praise God. Praise. <laughs> Did you all hear that last phrase? Now, do you see how, you know, unfortunately, I got at least four hours I can talk about this man. Before my subject was David anointed to be king of Israel. And to all of you young people here, uh, I said before that David was anointed to be king at about 15 years old. And it took him another 15 years at the age of 30 before he actually became king of Israel. But I encourage young people that uh, when God anoints you to do something, don't despair and fall apart and quit because it doesn't happen right away. If God has called you, and that's another way of saying if God has anointed you, if God has put his spirit up on you, which I shall explain a little bit more so that you'll understand it. Don't despair. God will make it come to pass. And I'm pleading with young people in this town, the first calling on your life is to study. Timothy taught us that. He said, study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needest not be ashamed rightly dividing the word of truth, didn't he? It, it, it baffles me a little bit. I think I heard... Uh, Young Dr. Wheeler said it took him 44 years to get there. I'm 75. <laughs> I got him some. And uh, I can say what Dr. young Dr. Wheeler was saying there. I'm a little selfish too. I want to see people succeed. You know, if you could just understand, and when people tell you there is no failure in God, that's true. If you fail, you have to fail by yourself. I'm 75. I can't recall a single time that I could stand here and say to you truthfully that I saw a time that God failed. I haven't seen it. And if you just stop, stop, and recognize that God has put an anointing yes, upon you. And he declares, even when he talked to Satan in the Garden of Eden, he said, Satan, I'm going to set up this situation between the seed of the woman and the seed of Satan that you have the right to bruise his head. And of course, he will bruise your heel. But he can't defeat you. And if young people could understand that, there's no way you'd drop out of school. No. You just won't do it. You, you will stay in there. You can make it. You understand what I'm saying? Because God's anointing is upon your life. And I'm going to share that with you this morning. I want you to see it. I got so much here, so I, I'm actually rewriting my script as I go. But I just want to... Just lay uh, one or two things on you. 
So that you don't understand it? Listen to this. I'm talking about the anointing. I said David was anointed. He couldn't fail. Well, I tried to help you understand the last time I was here that Jesus was in the synagogue. And they hand him the Bible and ask him to read. And he opened the Bible to a prophecy about himself. And I want to tell you where that is. It's Isaiah 61 and 1. And this is what Jesus read. And this is, listen to this. And the spirit of the Lord was upon me, he read. Because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. To heal the brokenhearted. To preach deliverance to the captives. To recover sight to the blind. And to set at liberty them that are bruised. Did you all hear that? Jesus had the power of God upon his life as he read that scripture. And what that meant prior to his being anointed, if you want to know where that first anointing took place, is when John baptized him. And it says he was led by the Spirit. He came out of the water, he led by the Spirit. And the note said that the Spirit came upon him like a dove, didn't it? Like a dove, not a dove. Form of a dove. And God acknowledged that this is my beloved son. I am well pleased with him. Think about that. That God declares that there's no flaws in him. Well, he almost said that same thing about David. When he put that anointing upon David, he said, David is a man after my own heart. You get that? I only know one other guy that God bragged on. Talked to old Satan once. He said, Satan, have you recognized my servant Job? A righteous man? A man who fears God? Runs from evil? Old Satan came out in his arrogance, didn't he? Oh, yeah, I says, I've checked him out. I checked him out just like... I checked all the rest. What Satan said. Satan is watching you the same way. But Satan was wise enough to say, listen to this. It's the only reason why he's doing all that good stuff that you proclaim in there is because you got that hedge around him. That hedge was God's anointing that he had upon Job. Well, he has that same anointing upon you this morning. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes, Let me teach it this way for young people. Uh, the word Christ is more than just Jesus. You understand? Christ means the anointing or the power of God upon Jesus. Now he's Christ Jesus. You see what I'm saying? Before he had that anointing upon him, did you realize he couldn't raise anybody from the dead? Amen. But after he had that anointing put upon him, as I told you when he was, came out of the water and he placed that spirit upon him and it said the same spirit of God led him into the wilderness to be the tempted of the devil, didn't it? The Holy Spirit is a leader, you see right there. Led him into the wilderness. And that spirit was on him, but after that, he called Lazarus out of the grave, didn't he? Yes, sir. That means he had the power over death. Yes. He went to the city of Nain, and a woman was taking her son to the grave. He walked up and said, what's going on here? The woman was weeping. He says, no, no, take him and go home with him. That was the anointing upon him. Did you hear that? Oh, right. Jairus was one of the big boys. Came stumbling through the crowd and got, fell at Jesus' feet. So listen, I have a daughter at home. In fact, I think she's already dead. 
And uh, he said, but I know you can handle it. <laughs> Old Jairus even knew that he bought that anointing, didn't he? Yeah. Jesus got to Jairus' house. People standing around said, oh, she, she's dead. Jesus says, no, she's not dead. She's asleep. They got to giggling and sniggling, and Jesus said, get this bunch out of here. Well, you ought to say that same thing. When the Spirit of God is upon your life and you got something to do and people try to tell you you can't do it, you tell somebody to get this bunch out of here. <laughs> My God. Went in and took the young lady by the hand. Took the one young lady by the hand and she got up. That was that anointing on him. And, and God put that same, Jesus put that same anointing upon you and me. We just don't have the faith and guts to do it. He says, in my name, you can lay hands on the sick. And that sick will get up from there. But you got to have the faith to do it. Did you hear what I'm saying? Now let me tell you something else. I'm getting close so you can understand what anointing means. The word Christian means more than just Christ-like. Do you know what it means? The anointed. Did you get that? If you are a Christian, you are one of the anointed. And you ought to leave here this morning. When you walk the streets and people look at you, put a smile on your face and say, I'm one of them. I'm one of the anointed. You understand? Lay hands on people and, and believe God that they will get well. Lay hands on yourself to make it start with you. Don't go someplace else. Right. Lay your hands on you. Right. And watch God heal you. Right. You understand what I'm saying? Yes. You'll get some momentum by the time you get to somebody else. Do right. you understand what I'm saying? That's what I'm talking about when we're talking about that anointed. Now this ought to excite all of you. But I was almost as old as I am but now before I understood this. Watch this. This will knock you off at sea. If you are a Christian, there is an anointing upon everything you do. <laughs> People don't understand that. Amen. You are something special and don't realize it. Because no one has taught you. There's an anointing upon everything you do as a Christian. And I learned this from Paul. Did you know what Paul says? You know what Paul says? I can do all things yeah. through Christ yeah. which strengthens me. Yeah. Well, that's what he's talking about. Everything you do, which strengthens me, is talking about the anointing that he, Jesus had upon him. He didn't say who strengthens me because that was referring to Jesus. But which strengthens me is referring to the anointing that was upon him. Well, if you're a Christian, you have that anointing upon you. And everything you do, if you will just recognize it. You listen to a teacher this morning. Whew, I have to remind people of that. You understand what I'm saying? I even excite myself sometimes. I say some things I don't know I'm going to say. Oh, yeah. Some things come out of me. I have to. Do you get what I'm saying? The God will let things pop out there that you don't even know what they are. So when you go out of here now, then you say, I'm one of the anointed ones. Did you get that? Now we got that. Now let me just shift gears just a little bit because I'm rewriting things here. I'm talking about David. Watch this. This is a shame. Well, should I say that? That may be a little strong. But I'm concerned that this David has walked around in scripture all of these years and, and we only accentuate the one blunder in his life that he made that anybody can talk about. But I am looking at David as the shepherd boy in his early life when God taught him the meaning of faith and how to trust in God. Did you all hear that? <laughs> I'll explain it to you. 
in a few minutes. Maybe I should do it there because I'm rewriting what I, I, I just got notes here, but I'm rewriting. God taught him as a shepherd boy how to trust in God. And I think that's why he could write the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul for his namesake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadows of death, I will feel no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Surely the goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Not one part of it. That boy learned that as a shepherd boy. I learned to quote that as a boy too. You understand what I'm saying? Well, I learned that since I just quoted it, I didn't know it was going to come out. As I said, I'm rewriting. Uh, in old age, that 23rd Psalm, David was simply bragging on God. I didn't understand that until I'm almost as old as I am right now. Notice that David talked about nobody but David in that Psalm. He was bragging on God. You understand what I'm saying? Now, brother, please weigh me down with my time because I, I can't see and, and I'm rewriting and I don't know what's going on here. <laughs> you get what I'm saying? But I'm going to go until you push me down from here. You understand? Because I got three or four, five hours here. <laughs> On David. Let me put out something else here. I, I just want you to see something that no one talked about. David was a capable musician and a poet in Israel. David wrote 80 of the 150 Psalms. I know something about writing. God has blessed me with the ability to write. You understand what I'm saying? People don't talk about that. 80 of the 150 Psalms were penned by David, the same David. David was a tremendous musician. I have not found out where he learned that skill. But even the anointing of David was even in his music. When Saul went almost insane and somebody said, listen, go get this boy, this son of Jesse, and let him play to him. David came in with his harp and played to him and drove the evil spirit out of him with his music. The man had the anointing even in his music. Did you hear what I say? Even his music was anointed. People don't talk about that. We also find out here that David was the anointed king at the age of 15 to replace Judah's first king, who was Saul. Did you understand? And as I alluded to the young people, that it took him some 15 years before that would come to realization. Did you get that? God also had his hand on him, which I'll be getting into in a few minutes. I just want to have my mind much of my time. <laughs> well, I don't know what's going to happen here. But when Israel, uh, well, Judah was challenged by the Philistines and uh, had this giant, Goliath. 11 feet tall, can you imagine? Even the stature and the aura of this man, as he would walk up, people's heart would just stop, and men would start running from him. And he walked with the arrogance of a lion. Did you all get that? Well, it was this David that slew him. Did you understand? It was the anointing of David, of God upon David's life for even able to do that. We'll talk about that in a few minutes, if I can get that far. Did you get what I'm saying? After he slew this giant, I saw maybe his military general. And everybody in the military honored David, loyal to him. But that was this evil spirit that was in Saul that wouldn't quite allow them to get together. He still wanted to kill David. Yes, and even his son loved David. 
But somehow or other, this king, Saul, wanted to kill him. And we got to understand that this man, it was no joke that God said, this man was after my own heart. Yes, sir. Uh, Saul was running, chasing after David, and, and God so happened to have him to go away into a city, or well, to a desert place, and ran into a cage, and they wound up in the same cage in the ground. And when they were able to exit, God caused a, a sleep fatigues to come upon Saul and his army, and David had a chance to go into his camp and cut our him off his garment as evidence that he could have killed him. But this man was so humbled to that anointing. Listen to this. The reason David didn't kill him. Jesus, God had said, touch not my anointed and do my prophets no harm. That's why. And, and, and David had general had supporters. So wait a minute. God told you he'd put your enemies in your hand where you could kill them. David said, oh yeah, I, I remember that. But he says, touch not God's anointed and do his prophets no harm. Oh, you hear what I'm saying? And when they came out of that cave, he, David had a chance to talk to him, and he says, I don't know where your head is, but I have this cloth. I have this piece of your garment as evidence that I could have killed you. I have it right here. Hell, let him wave it. And that kind of opened Saul's eyes. It must be something special, something different about this man. And eventually he had to admit that David had more anointing than himself. Do you hear what I'm saying? When God's anointing is upon your life, you're going to make it. Did you all hear what I'm saying? You're going to make it. Amen. David couldn't fail. David couldn't fail. He, you know. Well, let me move on to something else here I got down here as I'm writing. David then, it says a man after God's own heart. You and I ought to be a God, after God's own heart. That simply means that if you're after God's own heart, you're going to line up mind, body, and spirit in line with the will of God. Amen. That's what David was most of his life. Every time something happened, you'll note that David appealed to the Lord. So what shall I do in this case? Do you understand what I'm saying? One of the times, one of the times... Uh, that he was coming back home after he was running from Saul. And he noticed God took care of this man. Put him, he went to the land of the Philistines. And uh, God, he asked God, said, where shall I dwell? And he sent him uh, to a place called uh, Hebron. Now you're going to learn a little something. Well, when he got to Hebron, the tribe of Judah anointed him as king of the tribe of Judah which was his second anointing. Did you all get that? But what I, what I want to tell you is, is that this, you're going to learn something here. David took on six wives during that escapade. And he had six children during that time. Nobody ever told you that before, did they? But note also, <laughs> one of the rewards for killing, uh, my time is coming, thank you, sweetheart, five minutes. One of the uh, rewards for killing David, anybody who kills, I'm sorry, uh, Goliath, one of the rewards is that the king says, I'll give you my oldest daughter, number one. I'll give you riches. And uh, I'll give you a house free of choice to live in. Well, when he got ready for that to be done, Saul chose to give that first daughter to somebody else. And therefore, that meant his second daughter, Michal, came up and she loved David. And David took her on as his first wife. There were no offspring to that, to, that, to Michelle. And in fact, the Bible says she had no children at all, in, in her whole life. 
but that was his first wife. In addition to the six that he took when he was in Haran. Did you get that? And the next thing that, uh, no, uh, the next thing here that we find that, notice that he was king of Judah, the tribe of Judah, is that right? Well, after that, I guess I was, I know I gotta be down in about two minutes. After that, uh, you'll find Saul, his three sons, and his armor bearer were killed in war. And as a result of that situation, David is approaching 30 years old now. And as a result of that, the people of Israel came out and anointed him for the third time to become king of all of Israel. David took on some more concubines and two more wives, so I got him up to eight right now. You understand? And you'll find that when he took on those other wives, I identified uh, 14 more children that he had. So six and 14, we got him up to 20, is that right? Had one daughter, her name was Tamer. Did you get that? And the kid that he had by uh, Bathsheba, God didn't allow him to live. That's about 21. So therefore, you can see that David was a family man. You understand? I don't say that lightly because he loved them all. He loved them. I'm down to three minutes. I'm getting it. But as I say, people, I'm rewriting this. I got this here, but you haven't seen me turn a page, have you? I'm going, to get, I'm going to get it done before it's done. There's so much about this man that people ought to know. But the most important thing is when he sinned. Read chapter 51 of Psalms. So Lord, wipe out my transgressions. He repented. He says, I'm sorry for what I've done. And then the most important thing he said. Drive not thy Holy Spirit from me. Amen. Get that. He was talking about that anointing. And God indeed did not drive that spirit from him. I'll stop with that. Thank you so much.